Welcome to the International Teacher Podcast with your host, Matt the Family Guy, Kent the Cat Guy, Jacqueline from JP Mint, and Greg the Single Guy, bringing you episodes from around the world about the best kept secret in education. You've got it, international teaching. Welcome to the show. So, this is Greg reporting live with the International Teacher Podcast. I'm sorry it's a little early, so Kent is probably asleep. It's the morning and the weekend for him, so I pardon that, of course. But I do have someone a little bit later in Mexico, and that is my co-host, Jacqueline. How you doing, Jacqueline? Hi, Greg. I'm really excited because I get to talk with an old friend. This is um, a friend that I have not seen. Well, I haven't seen physically in years. We worked together. I, I was trying to work it out. I think it's 20 years ago. We worked together in Istanbul. And so I'm so excited to have her on the show. Well, hello, Annette. Hi there. Thanks for having me. Annette, can you tell me your name again? Because I, I noticed that you actually have a hyphenated name. I knew you as Annette Goebbels, but I think, are you going by the, um, the hyphen now? Mm. No, so I'm going um, by Annette Goebbels. Uh, Goebbels is my husband's name. And my maiden name is Van Orden. Um, but I go by Goebbels. So you had it right. Thanks. Oh, all right. And can you tell us, so I said, I hinted that you were in Vietnam, but can you tell us, Um, what city and what's your position and how long you've been there and kind of uh, sort of roll us through that where you are now. Mm, Definitely, yeah. Um, Yeah, so I'm currently in uh, Hanoi, in the northern part of Vietnam. Um, And I'm working at the school, uh, UNIS, United Nations International School. Um, This is my third year here. And yeah, we started three years ago um, during COVID times. So that was a very interesting start here, our first year, Uh, meaning quarantine, lockdowns, uh, three quarters of the year, teaching my students online, students I'd never met face to face. Um, So that was my first year here. And then last year, things got a bit more normal. And now this year is, yeah, we're fully back to normal and really enjoying my time here. It's a beautiful country and a, a great city. And you're teaching? Uh, I'm teaching uh, mathematics. Um, My role is um, curriculum lead of high school mathematics, grade 9 to 12. And so I'm teaching MYP and DP math. Excellent. And are you by yourself? You did mention a husband. So who do you have with you there? Mm, Definitely. Yeah. So over these past, what is it, 16 years, we have been traveling as a family of four. Um, However... Now we are here with the three of us because my son, my uh, eldest, just graduated last year. Um, so now it's my husband who is also a international teacher here at Eunice. He's teaching design, MYP and DP. And my daughter, she is in grade 12. And oh. yeah, and my son. I remember she was six, I think. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Um, no, yeah, so the, we're, we're here with the three of us um, for the first year, so that was quite a big transition for our family after being together as a unit of four uh, all these years. And where is Raf? So Rafael, he is uh, now back home in the Netherlands. Well, I'm saying home. For him, it's probably less home than it, it, it used to be for me uh, because he hasn't lived in the Netherlands for more than, what would it be, three years uh, in total uh, before now, move, now, now having moved to the Netherlands. Uh, so he's in Amsterdam. He just started his um, his medicines program. Ooh, very nice. So he was into the sciences. Definitely. Yeah, which was interesting because officially uh, as part of the DP program, you can only take two sciences. And uh, the Netherlands requires th- all three sciences uh, as an entry requirement for medicine. Uh, so he had to actually study one of the three sciences by himself to, to be able to enter that program. So he was doing some kind of an online or uh, self-study? He did a self-study, yeah, biology. He just he just did it and took the, the state exam in the Netherlands uh, last summer. And here's something that might be interesting for our listeners. Uh, when you go overseas and you have children that are, you know, going up in grades and say you're a high school teacher, did you ever teach your son or did you ever teach your daughter? I did not. No, no. We've always been at schools that were big enough that we had multiple uh, classes in uh, grade level. Uh, So they have never been in my classes. I did help them a a bit with their math work. Yeah. (laughs) 
Okay. Well, that's interesting. Cause I was thinking that maybe you had been at some smaller schools. Um, Greg, you might be interested to hear how many different countries that Annette and Jacques have lived in. Do you, did you happen to make a list, Annette? Um, yeah, I, I do remember all of them. So do you want me to, to, to list them? Yeah. So maybe, um, maybe we would just take a step back and we talk about where did you start off? So where we met and then kind of move us forward from there. Yeah, I will. So it might also be interesting to do one extra step back. So I studied mathematics in university and then I did this one year teacher program, uh, which was fully focused on bilingual and international education. So that was a postmaster uh, teaching program. So for any of maybe the Dutch listeners, they might be interested in that because it really helped me um, like that, that was just the way for me to get to international teaching right away. So I did that and I taught for four years at a bilingual school in the Netherlands. Bilingual being Dutch and English? Like English, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, before I then actually went to my first job fair in London and uh, had like, these amazing options all of a sudden coming up. Uh, and that, that's where we actually accepted a job uh, in Istanbul. What year was that? I'm trying to remember if it was 2005? No, three. 2003, it must have been. Oh, okay. Yeah. Is it? Sorry, let me just think about this. No, 2007, I think. Anyway, around that time. Um, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So yeah, it must be 2007. Um, and this is when we actually went as a family with two young kids, right? They were one and three years old. Uh, we just made a jump. Uh, it was obviously a big step for our young family, uh, as well as because my husband had a job in the Netherlands at a, um, a web design office. Uh, and he just quit his job and we just went on one job uh, to Istanbul. Um, but soon after, uh, obviously, the school realized his talents and he rolled into the school in the IT department initially and started teaching as well. Uh, so that was, yeah, that was really, really a big, big step, right, for a young family. But I think we never regretted it. Yeah. It, it worked out. Well, let's maybe take a pause here and let's talk about your family's reaction, family and friends' reaction about your announcement that you're going to go overseas. You know, you went to London, you, you got a job, you came back to, to the Netherlands, and then what was their reaction? Um, mixed. I, I think they were very excited and happy for us. It was, a, yeah, I think we were the first people in their environment who, who did that. I definitely remember my parents not being overly thrilled because we just had, right, our kids were one and three years old, so they, they really loved spending time with them. And they realized that that time was going to be much less. Having said that, like then the time we spend with them after we moved abroad, it's very different. It's much more intense, like the summer holidays or the other holidays, either they come to us or we go to them. Uh, it's, it's very different because you, it's more, you only have so much time, so you spend it much more intense in an intense way. I find that fascinating because I have run into so many Dutch people overseas over the past 20 some years that I don't think that there are any Dutch people living in Netherlands. I think it's all Germans and other nationalities is my idea. <laughs> I love being around Dutch people. I'm never around them enough anymore where I'm at. But I think that you guys are wonderful as a, a whole group. I think it's interesting that more of you in your community had left before your family did. So I just thought I'd say that it's a great compliment to have you overseas. Uh, the Dutch are always an enjoyment. I can't wait to hear the rest of the countries you went to after that. Oh, thanks for saying that. That's good to hear, yeah. So you had some mixed reports, and then I want to know if anybody was l kind of like me and my, and my friends and family, very worried about me moving to a Muslim country, moving to Turkey, um, you know, despite the sort of reputation that it's, it's half European, half Asian. We know, we know, having lived there, that it's, it's actually very smallly in Europe and mostly in Asia. Um, but was, was, did anybody have sort of worries about that? I don't think so. Um, maybe it's also because Turkey is, is pretty close to the Netherlands and we have many Turkish people living in the Netherlands. Um, and also, yeah, many, many Dutch people would visit Turkey for a holiday, uh, at that time, yeah, maybe not as much as later, but but still, I, yeah, I, I don't think that was the general feeling about us going to Turkey, no. 
And what made you choose uh, the school that we went to? Um, what what decided you? Because I'm ta- I think you must have had a number of offers at London. What made you uh, sort of weigh your options and decide to go for Turkey? Mm, good question. We did have several offers on the table, uh, and I I remember that weekend. It was. Amazing. I, I was there and my husband and children were at home. And so we had these calls up and down and talking about the options. And uh, and obviously that decision has to had to be made by the end of the weekend, right? That's that's how it usually Oh, works. wow. Really? They didn't give you, like, because uh, Greg, maybe did, you, did you ever have that situation, Greg, where you had to make the decision in the same weekend? Actually, I usually did. I, it was just the way that I worked. I didn't have a spouse that was uh, I had to confer with. We didn't have to make a decision right then and there. So for me, it was being single, a single guy. It's easier to make a decision on the spot. And I've been lucky enough to meet and have enough interviews to make an informed decision. Usually, I was lucky enough for that. So, Annette, you weighed your options, and then you were uh, face. Well, I guess not FaceTiming. What the heck was Skype at that time? Yeah, good question. Probably, yeah, probably <laughs> skyping your skyping your family, hmm. and then you signed with you signed with Turkey. And how many years did you end up staying there? I'm trying to re- recall how many uh, years we saw each other. Uh, we stayed for three years in Turkey. Um, we in the third year we had to make a big choice, mainly for our own children. Um, they were so our school in Istanbul, Koch school, was bilingual, right? So. Um, it was half Turkish, half English. Their Turkish was perfect, like it was fluent, uh, and their English was coming along nicely as well. Uh, but it was a big choice for us. Um, I think if we had stayed, we would have stayed for many, many more years because of the bilingual uh, nature of the school. Or we would then choose to go to um, an English, fully English-speaking uh, international school. So it was not an easy choice because Turkey... We really, really enjoyed Turkey uh, and all the aspects of it, Uh, the food, uh, the people, the culture, uh, the climate, um, the historic side. So it was a really hard choice for our family. I think we're really lucky that our first um, experience overseas was such a good one. Uh, But in the end, we decided to, to move. Yeah. Yeah, because you bring up a good point. When you have children that are before age, uh, school age, then they don't necessarily go to the the school that you're teaching at. They might have home care, right? They you probably had somebody in the house, and that somebody in the house was Turkish. So she didn't speak Dutch, presumably. She might not no. have even spoken English. No English. So then that's how your children got so bilingual, or not bilingual, but so um, they got the local language so quickly. But then when Raf was getting closer, Raphael was getting closer to school age, that's when you needed to determine if it would be a good idea for him to join the school or not. Yeah, he did. He did uh, the first year, I think it was called kindergarten there. He did that first year. Uh, again, it was bilingual. Uh, and again, I mean, the school was great. Um, so it wasn't that. It was just, yeah, are we going to stay here for many more years or not? And indeed, our nanny... She spoke Turkish only, and I remember very well at some point, maybe six or eight months into the first year, our kids were playing and they were like speaking in Turkish and we didn't understand them. <laughs> <laughs> they were trying to talk to you, not, not, I, I imagine they were probably talking to each other in <laughs> Turkish. That was maybe their language. But then when they were turning to you, they were still speaking Turkish? No, 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 no. We were just trying to listen into their conversations and their play. <sighs> with themselves, the two, the two of them and some friends, and we couldn't understand everything. <laughs> <laughs> so then you decided, okay, well, it's time to try a new school, a new international uh, situation. And where, I, I, I don't remember, where did you end up um, trying to find a, a job? Did you go back to a recruiting agency? Yeah, we actually did. Yeah, so we so this was about yeah this was about two and a half years um, international teaching. Um, so we decided again to go to a job fair. I think again in London, if I'm not mistaken. Um, we did sort of got in touch with a couple of schools prior to the to the job fair, and then continued conversations in the job fair. 
Um, yeah, so then we actually decided to go to uh, Angola in West Africa. And that was also an interesting decision again. Um, they contacted us before the, the job fair, uh, knowing our two, two uh, positions and being interested in us. And then we pretty much said, my husband and I pretty much said to each other, you know what, we can accept a lot, like we're very open-minded. We can accept a lot of different countries, continents, uh, uh, but we're not going to go to Angola. <laughs> and <laughs> of course we ended up in Angola. So what what made you finally take the jump? Yeah, so I, I think the two or three conversations, interviews and conversations I had with um, the head of school and the high school principal, um, they they were they were very good. They they were very down to earth and really uh, sharing not only like the positives but also okay, this is what Angola is like. Uh, you need to realize that if you live in Angola, uh, things like safety and health related. Um, so I, I I really appreciated how open they were about that, and they clearly didn't want to run the risk of hiring people who then a month later said, oh. Why didn't you tell me what, what, what's going on and maybe wants to leave? Uh, so I appreciated that. Um, just learning more about the school definitely helps. Um, like a three program school, PYP, MYP, DP, um, which we really, really like as a family. Just the fact that it is in Africa, we knew it was going to be a big adventure, but then we, we learned as a sort of a family unit in Turkey that we we could handle a lot. We, could, we, we were okay, right? Being in this new country, uh, we managed to be happy and we really enjoyed it. So we, we figured, okay, we can we can do this. So let's go for the next adventure. And how many years did you end up staying in Angola? Four years. So I have a great question for you, for our listeners. We don't talk a lot about the IB. Oh, okay. Yeah. Like we have uh, teachers from the US and Canada and Australia listening in and they might not know what this IB experience is. So I think that's what Greg is trying to say especially now having a parent, being a parent and having your children go through that system. Can you tell us a little bit about it? Yeah, yeah, definitely. So the IB, the International Baccalaureate System, is um, it's a, it consists of three programs, the PYP, the MYP and the DP. Uh, PYP being the primary school age, uh, primary years program. MYP sort of compared to the middle school um in, uh, I guess in the American system, and then the DP, the, the diploma program, um, only the last two years of high school. So that would be students being 16, 17, 18 years old. What's nice about schools who have the um, the three, who are three program schools, because not all international schools are that, um, it's very well aligned. Um, so the way sort of the uh, pedagogical approach uh, in the primary years program um, really nicely aligns with then the approach in the middle years program and that feeds in nicely into the diploma program. Um, so we've always, we, we moved to Angola and then after the countries after that, the schools after that, we've always specifically been looking for um, three program schools uh, because we just really like it as teachers. Um, and we like it for our own kids. Uh, so, so the pedagogical approach being uh, inquiry-based, uh, being concept-based. And that's, yeah, I can compare it, for example, to the Dutch system. I, I really appreciate that. And uh, the, the, the general skill set that students develop by being in those programs is very uh, valuable. Yeah, and I'm sure it, it helped your son uh, get into medicine right, you know, right off the bat from graduation. Yes. So you were arriving in Angola, and can you tell us a little bit about the setup? You know, did you get greeted at the airport? Did you did, did they provide housing? Did you have to look for a house? Can you kind of tell us a little bit about Angola? Yeah, so Angola is is it's a pretty special country to to live in and to work in. Um, when we arrived, I think it it just had been eight years since they came out of the war. So. It's, it's pretty impossible for just coming there, arriving there and finding your own house or anything. So it was very well set up. Like um, the package that the school offered uh, included everything they, they had that had to be like that because it's it's just like I said, it's you cannot you, like shipping. Um, you might be lucky and get your get a shipment into Angola, but it might be taking a year or something. Oh. So <laughs> the, we didn't ship in anything. We just went with hmm. 21 suitcases, that was... 
Put it yes, <laughs> another packer. <laughs> yeah, so yeah, definitely we learned to travel light. Uh, we couldn't bring much, uh, but that was fine, right? Because uh, it was a, everything was was prepared for us. So the school uh, had um, a set of houses, and so we were we arrived at the airport with some other new teachers. There was another teacher teaching family who had more suitcases than us. So that was, that was good. Um, <laughs> but so we were picked up, picked up and then it was interesting because that drive from the airport to, um, to the area where the school and the housing was in, uh, that was quite a ride, um, during, through slums and, you know, very, being very tired from the flights, uh, just looking out of the window and like, oof, that was, we definitely realized like, okay, um, Yes, this, this is going to be quite an experience. Um, My first experience stepping off a plane and I was stepping off the plane into Africa was in Kampala, Uganda, and I arrived at night. And actually, I flew a KLM, probably one of your favorite airlines. So I flew from Istanbul to Amsterdam and then Amsterdam to Kampala. And when I got off the plane in Kampala, I was hit with the beautiful smell of flowers. I don't know what kind of flowers, but I remember smelling flowers and smelling the earth, like the the dirt. Um, and it was just gorgeous. I just remember that, like I actually came to tears coming down the the stairs because I was in Africa. And so I wonder if you had sort of an out of body experience at any point while you were there in your four years. Yeah, we definitely had so many beautiful experiences being in Angola and also in the surrounding countries. Um, we really enjoyed being so much more in nature. Obviously, we lived in the capital, right? We lived in Luanda. About half of the population lives in that area, in, in, in the capital. But other than that, it's it's so empty and so beautiful. For example, if you would drive south, and we did that almost every other weekend, we would drive south, uh, sort of along the coast, and then we would just go to a beach or we would camp on the beach, buying some crab from the local fishermen. And so just being out in nature and, I don't know, we, we really... After living in Angola for four years and doing the trips in Angola and also the surrounding countries, yeah, we, we really appreciate the nature and the sort of the emptiness of some of the, the country we don't have in the Netherlands, right? Everything is organized in the Netherlands and there's no spot that humans haven't been touching on. So yeah, that's that's quite a, that was quite the experience. And the trips, we, some of the trips we made with our kids, um, you know, flying down to Namibia, uh, renting one of those uh, cars, those trucks with the roof tents on top, and just driving, sleeping. The four of us sleeping on the on the in the roof tents, uh, going from sort of spot to spot. Beautiful, yeah. So on going on safaris to mm -hmm. to see the big animals. Yeah. So speaking of animals, um, Greg has a question. What do you call those big river rats that people eat there? Do you know that? <laughs> I'm not sure. No. <laughs> I'm, thinking. I'm thinking, is this an urban legend? Like um, the rodents of uh, an, like, an extraordinary size or something? Isn't that from Princess Bride, some movie, Greg? <laughs> I don't think these are real things. <laughs> oh, there were definitely river rats. Um, oh, okay. So they were. I, well, it was actually interesting related to that. Not necessarily about the river rats, but um, the, there's national parks in Angola. And actually, they were very empty um, because most of the animals were eaten during the war. So they, by the time we were there, they were still sort of trying to restock the national parks. Uh, some animals were being flown in by um, from Namibia uh, or other countries in the in the neighborhood. So it was that was that was definitely striking. Like being there so close after the war, that that was quite something. Also, the the other aspect was the the landmines. Right, Angola is one of the countries where um, I think after uh, two or three countries, they have the most land mines in the world um, and they're being cleaned up now. But that, that was definitely something we heard on the trips, uh, like, oh, uh, stay on the road. <laughs> if you're doing a road trip and you have to pee, don't go off the road, just do it on the road. Those kind of things. Wow. So, yeah. <laughs> that is something incredible to, to think that you, you and your children, your family had those experiences where field trips mean something completely different, right? When mm. you're not going off the beaten path 
quite literally, you're staying on the path, the very beaten path and making sure that you don't take a step off. Yeah, definitely. That's incredible. Yeah. So you stayed, you enjoyed your time. It sounded like you made the most of all your time in Angola. And I remember uh, seeing a lot of the photos and enjoying, you know, living vicariously through you and your family. And then what happened? Where did you, uh, did you go again to another job fair? Was it London again? And where did you go next? Hmm. Yeah, so we had to, in our fourth year, we had to uh, make a choice. Um, I think our main reason for looking for other uh, other country, other jobs, was that our children were getting a bit older. And in Angola, it was quite hard for sort of teenage children to be independent. They would always have to either be with us or maybe with a driver. Um, we lived in gated communities, uh, so we felt that uh, it wasn't so easy for them to sort of just become more independent. I think anyway, when you when you live abroad as a family, uh, you're quite a, uh, a close, like you you do a lot together, right? As a, a unit of four, like a family. And yeah, it's important for, for the children to have their independence as well. So we decided, okay, we, we're going to move uh, despite having like really enjoying uh, Angola and the school, by the way, uh, LIS was, was really nice. So we, uh, no job fair this time, uh, was it actually? Um, but we, we ended up going to China, uh, to Suzhou, which is a city, a 10 million city close to Shanghai, uh, to a, again, wonderful school, uh, SSIS, Suzhou Singapore International School. Um, so yeah, we made a move. Again, no shipment from Angola. We couldn't bring much, just some suitcases. So then a summer holiday in Netherlands, and then we moved to China. Uh, Greg had a question here that said, uh, imagine you get a lot of interviews when someone sees your resume is IB Math and as well as Jacques being tech. Typically, when you put your CV out there or you or maybe you're like switching on your availability on uh, on search associates or uh, uh, something like that. Typically, how how many interviews do you are you getting in the job fairs? I remember. The first couple of times we we found jobs through the job fairs, um, yeah, I think that that must have been around maybe six to eight schools on the first day who would then reach out to us, and we had a first round of interviews with. Um, and then later, like the past couple of times, we have done it online, uh, and then it's it's a bit harder to say because schools sort of they're not all doing this at the same time, uh, right? They yeah. they start their their process uh, either in October or November or December or January. Uh, so then it's a bit more spread out. So it depends a bit on us, like when we actually find a school that is a good fit for us and then we stop looking. But yeah, I'd say the first couple of times we, we went, we look for jobs, it would, would be around eight schools who would, then we would have an interview. You bring up a very good point in that, that it's, it's really important to find the right fit. It's finding the right fit at amazon.com at your better bookstores. It's a book that Greg Lemoyne here wrote for uh, international teachers to know a little bit more about heading overseas and the job fairs and also telling the stories of all his his fun times, but finding the right fit that you can find at your better bookstores. All right, let's take a moment for a little commercial about how to get in touch with us. You can, of course, find all four of us at the itpexpat.com. That's www.itpexpat.com. Or you could also find us at email at internationalteacherpodcast at gmail.com. We look forward to hearing from you. Or if you're into Facebook, we have a new Facebook group at www.facebook.com slash groups slash ITP expat, where you can find all kinds of inside information about ITP expat. You can also find us on Instagram at ITP expats. That's with an S. ITP expats is our handle. All right. And thank you, listeners. We have over a hundred countries represented by our listeners. And though we're not monetized, we are here for you. And we would like to thank all of you for listening. So let's get back to the show. Speaking of uh, right fit, you said Suzhou and specifically Singapore, uh, 
Singapore, Sujo, Sujo, Singapore. Yeah, that's right. It's the other way. Sujo, Singapore International School was the right fit. Can you tell us a little bit about how did you know it was the right fit for your family? Because I think some listeners would like to know what are some of the criteria for a family of four, for example? Yeah, that, that is a really good question. It's um, <laughs> We are always very thorough in our research. Um, we like to make a like a Google sheet or an Excel sheet, and we do a bit of a, a rating on schools. So we definitely have, um, we have spent a lot of time investigating schools and countries, and we would look at certain factors. There's a lot of factors, especially as a family of four with young children, and then later older children. The school is where you're going to spend most of your time. So for us, this, we really would put effort in researching about the school. Important factors are school size, like how many students are there, also, how many, what is sort of the ratio local students versus um, international students? For example, our school in Turkey was uh, almost fully Turkish, which is great. But if you have your own kids going to that school, it might be harder for them to, to integrate. Especially two blonde children trying to integrate. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I remember they, I could always, I could always find your kids on the campus. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so again, if I, I wouldn't have kids, I I don't think that would be a, a huge factor, but it has been for the past um, 16 years. Uh, so we would always look at that. Um, of course, we look at the financial package, what is included, what is the pay. Usually there's like what they say, call a saving potential. That's always hard to sort of rely on uh, because that really depends on your lifestyle. So we, we would look at it. Well, I know your kids were big uh, swimmers. Hmm. So I would imagine something to do with that extracurricular activity lifestyle after school. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, so definitely the last 10 years, we would definitely look for schools that had a swimming pool. Yep, good point. A sports program or um, things like MUN, right? Model United Nations, whether that's offered at the school. And then of course the country and the, and the city. So there is things like, for example, China and also here, um, air quality <laughs> is one you might mm. not even realize that, that that can be a factor, but it is definitely uh, the weather, housing situation. There's there's a lot of factors and, and sort of going through the motions of sort of a school comes up on your radar, starting to connect. It's such an emotional roller coaster. Like, oh, an opportunity comes up. Is this going to work or, and then maybe not. And then. Annette, were you like me where you could picture yourself in every single situation, every time you applied for a job, because that was my downfall. I don't know if, if I have such a great imagination, but I could literally picture myself in every situation and I would get so excited. And then inevitably, if I didn't get a response or if I got the response of, thank you, we're going in another direction, I would be so crushed because I had already had the you know the house picked out in my head or maybe even gone online and checked out all the apartments that were for rent and so were you like that yourself yeah yeah definitely that that's how you build it up right because you want to especially also again with the family you want to i don't know look into the options and sort of you get a feel for it and then yeah obviously you get enthusiastic and yeah and then if it doesn't work out back to step one right yeah but by the way the other factor i shouldn't forget for us was really important that it was a three program school so we would only look at schools that were pyp myp dp uh, but again that's for us and the continuity for our kids education it's very easy especially like i am a math teacher so in terms of math um if you switch for example, from an American curriculum school or a British curriculum school to IB, there might be the situation where you have some gaps, right? Um, if the alignment is slightly different. So that's something to keep in mind. Um, yeah, we just committed to the IB program. That's something that the listeners might find quite incredible for you to say that you moved from Istanbul, Turkey to Africa to China and your kids didn't have gaps in their learning because they were going through the IB program. That's one of the best things about it, isn't it? Is that the the alignment works all around the world. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Yeah, so I think it is really important to realize that, sure, there's the Australian curriculum schools, the American curriculum school, the British curriculum schools, French, and so on. Um, but that's, yeah, one of the main reasons why we... Besides, we really like the IB programs. Uh, it's it's a good reason to 
stick with uh, similar curriculum schools. Yeah. So I think at this point in your career, did you, was this a step into the head of department or had you been the head of department in uh, Angola as well? Yeah. In Angola, I was uh, head of the math department as well. And then in China as well. Yeah. And then I, I continued to do that. Yeah. Okay. And how long did you end up staying in China? We stayed for three years only. Like we had a lot of three-year assignments and that it's not ideal. I'd say, I mean, it's fine. Uh, we, we had a lot of awesome experience and opportunities. Ideally, I'd say we, we would stay a little longer in countries like Angola for four years or maybe five or six. Um, just because the first two years are taking so much effort, right? To learn the culture, uh, learn about the school culture, some language, get to know students and colleagues. Uh, generally, the third year is a year where things become easier. <laughs> and so for a couple of times, that was actually the last year for us. And we decided to move on again and make make it hard for ourselves again. Uh, but the reason, why we <laughs> yeah. le- the reason why we left China is mainly because of the air pollution. Um, mm. we, we wanted to actually be at a school so our kids could, throw, go, um, could go through high school, uh, graduate. And we didn't see that being China uh, so many more years in living the air pollution. You stayed the three years and then what happened? Where did you where did you go and how did you find that job? Yeah, so I do want to say that China, we also really enjoyed. Um, we, we made be- so many beautiful trips. We actually had a car, we got our Chinese driving license. Uh, we drove around and we went to different sites. And China is just amazing in the sense that it's hyper modern, but also the ancient culture um, that, that is uh, really, really awesome. So we ended up going to Singapore after China. Uh, we went to uh, CIS, Canadian International School. And yeah, similar jobs. Uh, again, three program school, quite a big school. Uh, CIS is big, has two campuses in Singapore. Uh, there's a lot of international schools in Singapore. So yeah, there, there was a, a change. The nice thing was that my children started learning Mandarin in China and they actually could continue with that in Singapore. That was that was actually a really good opportunity. What do they speak in Angola? Portuguese, uh, mainly. Oh, wow. Did they pick up any Portuguese while they were there? Uh, yeah, some. They, they did have, I think, in the, in the pre-YP, in the primary school, they had, uh, I think, one lesson a week Portuguese. Um, so they pick up, picked up some, uh, but then they lost it as well after moving to China. Greg was talking about how much he loves the Dutch people, but also I remember meeting Dutch people when I was a teenager in Canada and they spoke five languages and didn't think anything of it. Like it was just like, oh yeah, no, we don't speak that many. And then (laughs) because five for Dutch people was low. So I'm thinking your children are following in the footsteps of your culture and your country. Yeah. Yeah, so yeah, indeed, when, when we went to high school in the Netherlands, we, would learn, we learned four languages, right? And then it, it, during the last 20 years, we, we learned more. Like our, we learned Turkish quite well because our nanny didn't speak any English. So, and we, the school offered uh, twice a week, they offered language lessons. So we learned Turkish very well uh, and we still have it and our kids sort of lost it. It probably will come back to them if they would be in, uh, immerse themselves again in the uh, Turkish speaking environment. And then, so Mandarin, they learned quite well. My son did his exams in, like he did a Mandarin exam. And Ella is actually taking it as one of her DP subjects now. So she's going to graduate uh, with Mandarin as one of her courses. So yeah, no, it's interesting. And I really appreciate the fact that I've learned different languages because I have so many students in my classroom whose language, native language is not English. And I think I can help them with that because it's also not my native language. Even though Dutch and English is similar, it's much more similar than, for example, Korean and, and English. But still, I, I think I, I appreciate more like their, their struggle. Their, I, I understand the type of mistakes they make uh, because of, yeah, it's not my native then languages. And, and there, right there is one of the best reasons mm. to hire non-native English speakers for international schools. And I wish more heads of school would do that because you can understand where your students are coming from because you were like that yourself. You were an English learner at some point in your schooling. And I wish, uh, I wish heads of school and HR departments would not get on that native English speaker only boat 
and would actually think about modeling for your students. You know, you model every day what your students could do in their future. They could go internationally and they could teach overseas because they had a Dutch math teacher in Singapore or in China. Yeah, no, I, I do think it's very powerful. So that's definitely uh, people from the Netherlands or from other countries whose language is not native. I, I think it's definitely uh, a big advantage. Um, having said that, there there will be some requirements in certain countries or schools uh, that uh, you might have to do an English test. Um, I never had to do that because of my my teaching program. I did the the post the postmaster, uh, so it already included international um, education. Uh, but you might find that you would still, I think these days for China, uh, it's it's harder for non-native speakers to, to be hired in China because of that. Yeah, that's really unfortunate that they, they're they not looking at sort of the nitty gritty of uh, teachers' backgrounds or education and seeing, like for example in yours, where you had a bilingual postgraduate program as well as working in a bilingual school for four years, I think, right? Four years before you moved overseas. So all of this would overstate the fact that you could easily handle an English medium classroom. So I I just wanted to take a step back. You left China or you you were heading out of China thinking, okay, it's it's a little polluted. We need to um, find something a bit better for our our health, you know, for health reasons and and being I think also maybe that independence as well. I don't know that did the kids feel okay to strike out on their own in China or did they stick pretty close to home? China is is um safe and so the the kids definitely f- and we felt comfortable that they would get to school by themselves um on their bicycles and uh, so no, that that's China was felt really good for teenagers actually to to grow up. Yeah. Oh, okay, great. But um, did you go to a job fair or at this point? Because I'm thinking at some point in your career, I bet you you just started to get headhunted, and you used your network as opposed to because you mentioned that actually from Angola to China that you didn't go to a job fair. So did schools and did people just start reaching out to you and say, hey, Annette, when you guys are ready to move on to the next school, can you give us a call or can you let us know because we'd really be interested in talking to you? Not as much that people would reach out. I'd say it's more just opening our profiles again, like just letting the world know that we're ready to to move on. Uh, And then, yeah, from that moment, then then schools would be reaching out. Yeah. And so you went to the Canadian International School of Singapore. This is how small the world is, Annette, because when I accepted a job at coach school, guess where the other job offer I had in the world? Right. <laughs> CIS, yeah. It was CIS. So I, I had just got back from Korea. I had taught Korea in Korea for three years, and I was teaching French in Canada because... So interestingly enough, from Korea, I wanted to go to the Philippines at the ISM, uh, International School of Manila. But they looked at my CV and they said, you've never taught French. And I said, but I am French. And they said, but you've never taught it. How could, no, go home, get some experience and then, you know, try again. So I went home, I taught for three years and I taught uh, French in, in Canada. And then I went to a job fair And I had two offers. I had coach school in Turkey and I had Singapore CIS. And I thought, well, I just got back from Korea. I don't want to go back to Asia. I wanted something new. So isn't that how small the world is that we met at coach and then years later you ended up going to the school that. So I was always very curious to see your posts because I thought, gosh, that could have been me 20 years ago. How was CIS? At that time, uh, when I was interviewing with them, it was 2001. They had a motto, and I'd, I'd like to see if the motto still kind of works. It was, we work hard and we play hard. I was curious to know if that was still the case. I guess so, and I think it has to do with the fact that there are so many international schools in Singapore. Um, education is almost, I think, uh, what do you call it, like a sector. There's definitely students coming, sometimes even without the parents, coming to Singapore 
just for their education, for their their, their high school education. Um, I'd, I'd say we definitely noticed that there is a bit of competition going on in Singapore between the international schools because there is so many. And so that sort of competitive nature, that's I'd say that's probably the, the, the part I enjoy the least about the sort of the international school world there. Having said that, uh, there there's definitely pros to that as well, because there's a lot of schools, for example, for the sports competitions or what we didn't have much in Angola, for example, because it was so hard to travel uh, to other international schools. There was a lot of that in Singapore and pretty like close as well. So we didn't have to travel far. Uh, like in China, um, if I would, so I would go coach volleyball and we would have to go to Shanghai, into Shanghai to to visit the other schools to to play. Um, so that was that was really nice about Singapore. So I'd say it was a it's a well established school, um, which was good. Was it very Canadian? I'm curious because uh, being Canadian myself, I I was very tempted to go there, but then I thought, well, is it going to be like schools here in Canada? Like, did I really want to mm-hmm. experience something the same, but just in Singapore? So I'm curious, like. Um, did you did you feel a certain difference between the CIS campus, for example, and the other campuses you've had experiences with? Um, no, no, not really. I think, yes, Canadian is in its name. And I think originally they were, for example, using the Ontario curriculum. But definitely, yeah, true international school, um, PYP, MYP, DP. Yeah. So definitely not 98% Canadian students and then your kids. <laughs> no, 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 definitely not. No. It was a... Uh, a really good mix, yeah. Mm-hmm. And and w- how long did you end up staying in Singapore? We ended up staying in Singapore for three years. Uh, that was not our intention. Uh, but then COVID, <laughs> COVID hit. So this was, yeah, this was definitely affecting our plans. Um, we left Av- at the end of three years. Um, and we actually went back to the Netherlands for a year. Although we really would have liked our kids to have more stable sort of last six years of their middle school, high school. In the end, we did decide to to go home. Uh, Singapore was very strict in their COVID laws and uh, the island is quite small. Uh, one of the big advantages of living in Singapore is that it's such a beautiful location in Southeast Asia to travel many different countries, which we did in the first two years. Uh, but it was very much closing down during COVID. So very last minute in our third year, very end of the year, we decided to to leave and go back home for a year. Well, we didn't know by then it was going to be for a year, but we, we have a house in the Netherlands and we decided to, to go to the Netherlands and just see what happens um, afterwards. It was a really good experience. Um, our children being enrolled in the Dutch educational system for a year. For the first <laughs> time ever. First time ever, yeah. How were they greeted by the other Dutch kids? I think they had a really good experience. They ended up going, like the, the part where we live in Netherlands, it's it's not a big city, uh, so a bit more rural. Um, so they, were, they actually ended up going to a school that doesn't have a lot of transition. Um, so they were definitely sort of the few people transitioning into the school. Uh, but they, yeah, they found a good group of friends. And for them, I think it was a bit of a disruption, but at the same time, they learned a lot about their country. Uh, it was good for their Dutch language. Um, so yeah, uh, in the end, even though it was just one year, we didn't know that in advance. Um, we just saw, okay, let's see what's going to happen. Um, in the end, we did ended up going to Vietnam, so going abroad again, which was a like a big family decision. Uh, but it was it was a good year, yeah. Can you kind of give us a little taste of what that dinner conversation was like when you decided to go back overseas after just returning home mm. to your home country for one year? What uh, what did that sound like, and and who was sort of more vocal to go back overseas mm. and? Were, were there, was there anyone that wanted to stay? Uh, yes. So let me first say that every time we, well, maybe after uh, Turkey, because the kids were still very small, but every time we would make a decision like this, uh, we would definitely, it would involve our, the four of us. We would always make it a family conversation and just discussing pros and cons. And yeah, we would never just uh, like ask the, the, the parents, we would never just decide that by ourselves and then just tell the kids the next day, like, oh, by the way, we're going to. Uh, so it, it's always been a very much a family uh, conversation and, and uh, decision. Uh, so this one as well, uh, this one was very clear. My son was in his second to last year. 
So if he had if he had stayed, uh, he only had one more year of high school. Whereas uh, if we were going to move, he would have to start again in grade 11 because the Dutch and the, the IB programs are so different. Um, those last two years in the IB program, the diploma year, uh, program years, you have to do as a package. So you cannot start that in the last year. So uh, definitely my son was the one who probably had preferred to stay in the Netherlands and the, the other three, the three of us uh, preferred to go back overseas. Uh, my daughter, especially, she indicated that she really liked the IB approach. For, us, the, for, for her, the Dutch approach was different. Uh, and she pref obviously, she had been there in there for, the, for her whole life. So she, she preferred to go back into the international system. Um, and the same goes for my husband and for me. Um, in the end, we, we went with the four of us. We sort of thought, okay, maybe... Maybe our son can stay and finish by himself, but we didn't like that idea. He didn't like that idea. Uh, so he came with us, spent an extra year in high school, uh, but also had the opportunity, you know, to drive around on a motorbike in Hanoi, have a last sort of overseas experience. Uh, and I think in the end, he, he was really happy that we did it. Yeah, because in the end, what's the rush, right? Yes. What's, what's the rush to get into an adult life? Although, I mean, I'm now talking years <laughs> later, looking back, but he's just at the beginning going, no, 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 let me get my independence. Yeah, no, definitely. But it's, it is good to, for, for parents to, to realize it is it's a choice whether you want to go back at some point to the Netherlands. Um, if, if you know that your children might go to university in the Netherlands, I mean, that's not a must either, right? But uh, definitely the Dutch universities are, and colleges are very uh, good. Right, the quality of the education in the Netherlands is good and very affordable. Uh, so many of the Dutch students, after having been in international schools, uh, they would go then into the Dutch um, tertiary education. And that is a choice for parents to make. Like, do you want them to have the last couple of years actually in a Dutch high school to make that transition easier uh, or not? So we decided to, to, to do the or not <laughs> option. But lucky that he had that one year to feel hmm. uh, a, a bit more what the experience is like to live in in, in the Netherlands as well. Yep. So we're coming up to the big question because your daughter is graduating this year. Is that right? Mm. Yes. She is likely not going to study university in Vietnam. So the big question is, does mom and dad stay overseas while the children are studying university. Have you had any conversations yet to think about, are you going to be moving back home? Are you going to stay international? Uh, yeah, so far our thinking is that we're going to stay overseas, um, Shaq and I. Obviously, it's deep, deep, it depends on how uh, Rafa and Ella are doing. Like, um, are they finding their ways? Are they happy? Are they settling in? So these, these two months have been pretty important for us to sort of get a feel for how is it for Rafael to be by himself. Um, and we think it's going well as far as we know. Uh, so no, I, <laughs> um, the, for us, uh, like really important is that we have lots of family in the Netherlands. And so they can definitely fall back on them. Uh, if that wasn't the case, I think we might have preferred to, to move back. Uh, to be there for them. No, we're planning on staying overseas and we'll just take it by sort of by the year, see how it goes. We are enjoying it. I, I, I remember so well uh, the transition between Turkey and Angola. That's the moment where we actually moved to a, a, like a full international school. It was, it's, it was such a, a change for me as a, a, a teacher, uh, sort of the shift from there should be focus on classroom management, towards almost 100% goes to subject focus. Um, it, was, it's so, it's, it was so pleasant, that, that change. You bring up one of the main reasons why people head overseas is that they get tired of being the police officer in the classroom mm -hmm. and they just want to teach, right? They just want to be able to open young people's minds and have real conversations with them about the world and what they want to teach them as opposed to please sit down, <laughs> please put up your hand, yeah. please, you know, stop disrupting the class that there's so much time taken up 
doing that back in our home countries. And so you're saying that even in uh, in the Netherlands, you had that experience as well? Yeah, true. And and obviously it also had to do with me being a young teacher, right? Everyone, all teachers experience that at the start of their career. Um, it just becomes easier and easier. But so after the four years in the Netherlands and the three years in Turkey, which was a, a bilingual school, I definitely remember that that shift very, very well. Um, like, I don't know, it was, it's just such a joy to, like you say, uh, spend most of your time uh, really focusing on, uh, in, in my case, on mathematics and just the rich conversations and the, I don't know, um, just the whole culture in, in the international schools of having all these in, uh, nationalities together. Um, yeah, I can start. To I think I think students are very curious, you know, mm-hmm. and and when we get rid of the class disruptions, then their curiosity gets fed by the conversations that we're having in the classroom. Yeah, yeah, definitely. And it's, it's just very enjoyable. It's enjoyable for the students and also for the teachers. Um, it's just a rich environment and, and interesting. It's like even in my math room, I, it's just fun to, to talk about how do you actually, sometimes it comes up things like different notations or, and then I say, oh, you know what, in the Netherlands, this is how we write up a, a long division. And then people share that and just small things, right? But it's like the different perspectives. It makes it, it makes it fun and, and interesting. Yeah. So it sounds like you've definitely been bit by the international teaching bug. You're it, it's not letting go. It sounds like Ella is going to strike out on her own with with Raphael to sort of lead the way a little a little bit. But that you and Jacques might uh, continue to enjoy empty nest, but empty nest overseas, which is is a whole different concept. In all your travels, Annette, you know that ITP has their favorite question or their favorite topic are police stories. So in all your travels and uh, far and wide, do you have a fun kind of police story or a custom story, some some kind of story like that? Yeah, I've, I've got to go back to Angola for that. Let's see, there's two. Which one shall I share? So this was us uh, with a couple of families with young children. And I think it was a Saturday morning. We were on um, a small bus, like a van, with a school driver. And we were going to go to, down to the beach, which was, what would it be? Maybe a one-hour drive down south. And one of the children was a little bit bigger already, but didn't have a booster seat. And we knew there were going to be a couple of police checks on the way. So what actually happened is that whenever we saw a police check coming up, we would actually tell our kids, okay, duck for the police. Just duck so they don't <laughs> see you in the window. And they would just duck. And then after the police check, they would come up. Um, next one. Oh, please stop. Uh, okay, duck. So they. <laughs> so <laughs> this is like one of the first lessons we had. Uh, we, we taught our kids, okay, whenever police stop come, you have to duck. <laughs> <laughs> and did that continue on? And then you were like, oh, no, no, you don't need to do that anymore. <laughs> uh, you know, well, we had that conversation. Of course, they were still a little young to to understand the whole concept of that. But uh, yeah, we definitely we learned uh, a couple of things. Um, unfortunately, there were like there's the culture of bribes. And at some point, that's the other story. I'll do it real quick. We were stopped very close to our compound. But we were driving one of the school cars. So the, the school had a, a, a pool of cars you could book out. And we did have our licenses and we had the, like the car paperwork and we were stopped by, well, then we thought police, uh, later we learned it was fake police. We stopped mm. and they asked for our paperwork. So we gave it because we had the paperwork, uh, the car paperwork. They, they had it and they looked at it and then they said, uh, it's expired. And uh, we didn't have any way to sort of, because they had it, so we couldn't look at it anymore. We tried to call, uh, the school. Uh, we couldn't get through. So at some point we just, we had, we decided, okay, we'll, we'll, we'll pay the bribe. We got it back. <laughs> we got the paperwork back. And obviously later we, we realized that, uh, it wasn't expired, uh, but we had paid the bribe. And so we, yeah, that was the other story. But I'm imagining it wouldn't have been that much. I mean, it wouldn't have been much for you perhaps, but for them, it might've bought them a nice dinner that night or something like that. Yeah, I think it was it was kind of significant, maybe fifty dollars. So it was quite a lot. Oh, geez, yeah. 
<laughs> okay. I guess, I guess. Well, that's a little bit more than I thought it was. I thought a couple bucks. Let's sneak him a couple bucks and then just keep going. Yeah, yeah. Other times it was that. Yeah, but this one, hmm. yeah, that was. This was us. I think a half year into our first year, uh, still learning, learning everything. So yeah, we learned a lot, quite a bit there. <laughs> And then you had a car in China. Did you ever have any run-ins with with the police there? Did you have to worry about uh, your paperwork being in Chinese and trying to read it? No, no. I think China was all fine. It was interesting. The whole process of getting our Chinese driving license was interesting. We had to do a test, like a, a written test. Uh, I think just a couple of years before we did it, or maybe even one year, uh, they, they actually created an English language test, so otherwise it would have been in Chinese. That would have been very interesting. Uh, <laughs> so I remember oh, it was actually Fernanda and I, we did it together and we passed it together. So, yeah. I remember hearing about that. I remember yeah. hearing Fernanda passed her Chinese driving lesson. Yeah. Fernanda's a friend of ours, a common friend, and I couldn't believe it because I thought she was writing in Chinese when she told me. So that's good. So the other question we have here at ITP is, um, you know, you were talking about 21 boxes or 21 suitcases and then, and then not having shipping. What are the three things that you cannot live without overseas when, when your family and you move into a new space? What are the three things you can't live without? So we always, especially the first sort of 10 years, we always traveled very light. So we, we didn't have much sort of items we would be really attached to because we learned to travel light. And then definitely the items we really attached to, we just kept them uh, at home in the Netherlands. So I would just go with, yeah, I'm afraid this is a couple of typical Dutch uh, items. So food-wise, we always be sure after summer to bring back a couple of boxes of hagelslag. So that's the chocolate sprinkles that go on bread. Oh, okay. I remember seeing those. Def- All right. Something. I'm not sure if I still have an excuse once the kids are uh, not living with us anymore, but I, <laughs> I, I like that. Um, <laughs> so I might continue to bring that. You know, Dutch people eat a lot of bread. And so morning, the breakfast and the lunch often consist of just a couple of sand- sandwiches. So hagelslag would be uh, one of the toppings. And in the same sort of category, we would always bring back some stroopwafels, which is like the, the, the Dutch cookie with the caramel, like the syrup. Uh, and that's just because we like to share that. Many people overseas know them and we like them ourselves, but it's nice to sort of bring to, I don't know, maybe as a gift or just have them at a meeting or... They go, I hear they go very well with tea. You mm-hmm. know, when you dip them into the tea, yeah. they kind of get that soft and, and yeah, the syrup sort of stretches. Yeah, or a coffee. Yeah, you put them on a yeah. hot cup of tea or coffee. Um, and then the last thing I would say, uh, bicycles. We, here in Hanoi, we have two Dutch bicycles we actually shipped in. Uh, and then we, have, we actually bought our motorbikes here. But it actually literally say Dutch bicycles. We, we bought them secondhand from a, from a Dutch uh, rental. But so, so we shipped them in. And also from, we bought bicycles in China and we shipped them into uh, Singapore. So yeah, we still like to, to go, for example, to school by bike. Um, so yeah being dutch i guess and the and the rain doesn't seem to stop you thank goodness ah uh, what shall i say no no I, um i definitely had my 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 moments when i was young and living in netherlands uh like being in the rain isn't fun uh, wind and rain here it's a bit more fun because it's generally still warm when it rains so i don't mind that uh, same for singapore uh yeah so no <laughs> It doesn't stop. So just finishing up here, Annette, first of all, I just want to say how much I really enjoyed hearing the, I knew about your experiences, but I, I so enjoyed hearing more about them and each of them and sort of deep diving into each one. Before we go, uh, do you have any words of wisdom or sort of tips for, let's say for the Europeans, let's kind of expand outside of the Dutch teachers, but any European teachers that are not English native speakers, do you have any words of wisdom or tips for them about going international? You know, why should they do it if they're thinking of, of taking that jump? So I just, this morning I came back uh, after being away for five days with my grade 11 students. 
uh, we came back on an overnight train from this beautiful area, which is called Phong Nha. We came back on the train, a 10, 10 hour overnight train to Hanoi. Mm -hmm. And just those kind of experiences. I came back, uh, my husband was in another area. He came back yesterday evening from Bavi. And then my daughter, he, she came back yesterday afternoon, being yet in another area in Northern Vietnam. So that, just that and, you know, sharing our experiences and what did we learn about the local life in, in Vietnam. And that's just, I don't know, that's definitely just sort of giving you an, an idea of what it can be like and how rich uh, our experience is uh, as a family overseas. Uh, in terms of practical tips, doing some research about the schools and I think that the, the the organizations like Sirs Associates or Scroll or uh, any of those are really helpful in, in terms of summarizing what schools offer and, and um, their characteristics. That, that, that's very useful. And of course, reaching out maybe if you have people you know who are already overseas, that's, that's of course very helpful. Don't, don't be afraid. Like it's, it's a big step. I think that first step is huge, but it's, it's been such an, a joy for our family. With respect to the English language, that, that might be something to look into how schools view, I don't know, your your degree or um, that might be different from, con different from country to country. But you can certainly agree that your children were better for the education that they had overseas and that they had not only exposure to uh, English, I'm sure that they are super comfortable in English mm -hmm. as well as Dutch, but also that they had that IB continuum throughout their schooling that encourages them to be curious about the world. Definitely, yeah. And, and just being, I think, flexible. They, they became, and us as well, very flexible and open-minded individuals uh, because you never know, right? Uh, we may, we, we plan something in Angola, uh, but you always have to have a plan B. So you're not sure. Um, this is what you think you might be getting, but it might look differently. And I think becoming flexible in curiosity as well as I think is a big one, being comfortable with meeting new people. Yeah. I think that's, that's all such big advantages. Uh, we we've given ourselves. Well, on behalf of Greg, the single guy who is here in the studio, but unfortunately his internet has just been a little spotty today. Greg, are you able to say anything at this time? Uh, can you hear me now? Oh, wow. Hey, I fixed the audio. Should I hit record? <laughs> Let's do the interview now. <laughs> oh my gosh. <laughs> I'm so sorry I'm about my audio. My I just love listening to your stories. Thank you, Annette, for being on our show. It's so wonderful to hear your experience. Definitely, yeah. Thanks so much for having me. Really enjoyed talking. It feels a bit weird to talk so much about myself and ourselves, uh, but it's, uh, yeah, it's, it's been fun. I knew that the listeners would enjoy your stories. 